<laughs> all right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Misfit Nation. If you're feeling overwhelmed or floating towards the darkness, do not hesitate to phone a friend. If you're embarrassed that you were having a difficult time, call the Veteran Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255 and press option one. Again, that's 1-800-273-8255, option one. As we've told you many times over the last year, do not make a permanent solution to a temporary problem. If you have not had the chance, check out our first book, 13 Step Guide to Success. It is available in paperback and Kindle editions through Amazon. If you're new, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast apps. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Underscore Misfit Nation. So you'll stay up on all episodes as they release, while also having the opportunity of getting to hear the stories of our amazing guests. Speaking of which, our next guest is a Shochu in Awamori expert, author, host, and diehard Tokyo Swallows fan, incorporating his infectious enthusiasm and, and knowledge of Japanese spirits in all his professional endeavors. He launched Hankaku Spirits in March of 2020 with the mission of bringing intensely artisanal Japanese spirits to discerning American consumers, especially Koji-based spirits, including Shochu, Oomori, and Koji Whiskey. So without further ado, let's welcome to the Misfit Nation, Chris Pellegrini. How are you, Chris? Good. How you doing, Rich? Thanks awesome. for the, that very detailed introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> I try to get everyone as much information as possible so they're not out there wanting. <laughs> I, I think you succeeded there. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully I said all the, all the words correctly. I try to do it from memory and uh, not destroy them too much. That was, that, that was fantastic. Way better than some of the people that work for the same company I do. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> Outstanding. So, Chris, if you don't mind, uh, tell us a little bit about your story from as far back as you want to go to how you wound up in Japan uh, two decades ago now to what we're doing now. Uh, great. I'll, I'll try and give you the, the slightly extended elevator this is going to be a long elevator but it's okay. <laughs> uh, still the elevator summary um so vermont born and raised and um ended up uh as a as kind of the byproduct or the side effect of a u.s history course in high school ended up illicitly brewing beer at home when i was a kid and as you do and uh, it was uh, a lot of fun um, learning how to homebrew and learning how exciting it could really be to make something that people, people took a serious interest in. I suppose it's the same as becoming good at cooking, right? You, you make something that people sit down, they pay attention. And that's kind of like, that's kind of what I felt I was doing. Um, one errant day when I think I was about 16 my parents found out that I was uh, making beer at home they were not super super pleased <laughs> um, so after after finishing my my term being grounded uh, I went to the local home brewery uh, not home brewery the microbrewery in Middlebury Vermont it's called Otter Creek it's still there and I, I turned my experience into something that probably could be called an apprenticeship and um, you know one thing led to another and I was learning every aspect of the brewing process the not so much the business side of things but the the brewing the seller work the packaging it, pretty much everything I was doing everything and then one fateful day um, we had a crisis it was a one fateful week actually we had a crisis in the brewery and this was in 19, when would this have been? 1998, I think. And in the same damn week, our first brewer and second brewer were no longer with us. The first brewer, he wrecked his back oh. and couldn't lift 50 pound sacks of grain and was basically laid out. He was horizontal for about two months. And the second brewer in the same week left the state to join the circus. What? <laughs> <laughs> he wow. really wanted to become wanted to become a, a clown um i would argue that he always was a clown but um and then all of a sudden the ceo was like all right does anybody up in here know how to brew and little teenage me is like and he's like are you kidding the kid is that even legal and our cellar master tom said well you know if he doesn't drink it 
And then it was like, Pellegrini, you're up. And I became the youngest commercial brewer in the United States. I was too young to drink what I was making. And I was the most insufferable underage beer stomp you've ever met in your life. <laughs> you could not talk to me about Rolling Rock, right? Um, I was really, really stoked about what I was doing. And, you know, I, I was making stuff that people would line up for. And I was immensely proud of that. And I enjoyed the heck out of it. And that has stayed with me to this day. Fast forward a bit. I make it through college rather uneventfully. I live in Spain. I live in South Korea. I end up um, boy meets girl. Girl wants to come to Japan. I move here with her. And then I run into first sake, which is Japan's one of Japan's national drinks. It's made from rice. And a lot of people call it a rice wine. It's not. I don't know if you can really call it that. It's more like a beer than it is a wine, honestly, in terms of how it's made. And I started studying that. My impression of sake was pretty poor, given my, my time in the States. I mean, I used to drink. It was almost like a, if you lost a bet, you would drink it in the ah, States, yeah. <laughs> which was what I remember it from the 90s. Yeah. And I came over here and it was just immense and it was diverse and it was amazing it was so fragrant and it didn't smell like dirty feet we was like wow this isn't the sake i'm used to <laughs> um and uh, really got into it and i appreciated the crafts work and i i really appreciated the small scale of most of the production and then one day i was introduced to these crazy spirits and first first of all shochu s-h-o-c-h-u and you pronounce it perfectly and i was at a sake bar and the guy was bored. The master, the, the bartender was bored. He's like, oh, let's, let's mess with the, the semi-regular foreign guy. And he started <laughs> pushing these spirits in front of me. And I was like, what is this? And the first one I tried was a barley shochu. And then the second one he pushed in front of me was a sweet potato shochu. Mm -hmm. Third was rice, fourth, kokuto sugar. And then fifth was a buckwheat shochu. And every one of these spirits, despite being called shochu, was completely unique. Uh, and I, that just sent my, my radar all crazy. I was like, how, hold on, what is this? This is, these are all the same drink? How is that possible? Okay, that it is apparently possible. The guy couldn't tell me anything about it because it was a sake bar and he was just messing with the foreign guy. I was fascinated. And so I asked where these drinks were made. Um, sake is made pretty much in Northern Japan. Shochu and Awamori, which is Shochu's predecessor actually, are made down South where it's in a more tropical climate. And that's where the spirits traditions of Japan were born. And so I flew down there and that I began my education on these drinks about in early 2003. And there was no information about them. There was no, Wikipedia had just been born. There was no Shochu <laughs> page, are you kidding me? And I was just determined to figure them out on my own. And I spoke zero Japanese. My first Japanese expression, which many of you know is arigato gozaimasu, which means thank you very much. <laughs> and then my second Japanese expression was awanashi de kudasai, which means no foam on my beard, damn it. Because <laughs> they love to put that, you know, they put a, it's like, are we in Germany? They put this Brilliant. gigantic foam, half of the cup is, <laughs> is foam. And I wasn't having it when I first moved here. So that was the second expression I learned. <laughs> And I had a lot more learning to do. I mean, I think we can put it very um, simply that way. And it has been an unbelievable journey. It has been a journey that's gone from a hobby, just wanting to understand these drinks to proselytizing for these drinks, to becoming a government designated ambassador for these spirits, to launching, you know, companies and all sorts of quitting, quitting comfortable jobs and that sort of thing. So it's been a pretty wild experience and that as most of us who lived over in that region know it's hard for an outsider to go in and become like you said an ambassador or even launch your own company on their soil how were you welcomed or unwelcomed in in that in that scenario i i think i i think i did it kind of the right way and the, the way that it ended up going was i just wanted to be a friend and I wanted to support. And this was going back quite a, uh, a ways. I mean, we are talking from 2003. So from 2003 until about 2000, I would say until 2000, until the, the earthquake and the tsunami 2011, I was 
very, very earnestly just traveling down south visiting distilleries, making connections and doing whatever I could to support. I mean, sometimes when distilleries were shorthanded, I was sleeping on somebody's couch and I was, I was working in the distillery just to give them an extra couple of hands. It's something that I had done before. I mean, I'd worked in a, in a brewery before making small batch craft beer. So it wasn't a huge leap for me. Um, the, this, the process, the fermentation process for shochu and aomori is very, very different from making beer or making whiskey for that matter, but it was pretty easy to get into. And those years of just putting in the time and, and then also I was hosting my own events just to try and spread the word about shochu and aomori, even in Japan, where I was trying to talk to other imports like myself but actually what would always end up happening, and this is where the Japanese language ability became more and more important as I went, I would advertise these events in English, you know, shochu 101 or, you know, pairing aomori with food or whatever. And 75% of the guests would be Japanese folks. And they were like, well, I don't know where to go to learn about these drinks either. So I'm coming to you. I'm like, okay, well, this suddenly became a bilingual event. That wasn't what I planned. <laughs> and it was years of doing that that laid the groundwork and made a lot of what has come more recently easier because I was coming from a place of trying to help. And I wasn't coming from a, an angle of trying to capitalize from the beginning, making those connections, making, uh, establishing those relationships became invaluable when it came to the point where, okay, now, now I'm coming to you not as a friend anymore. I'm coming to you as potentially a business partner. And how about we find an even bigger audience for these amazing drinks? And I, I think that comes down to learning the culture. Like you, you had the ability to learn the culture a little bit as you live there for a little while and do this and kind of become part of it as you were there. I mean, since you've been there a very long time now, uh, probably half your life has been in Japan as, as opposed to being in Vermont. I've, I've spent I, more, more time here than I have in Vermont. Yeah, see. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> so you start to, you, you became one of them, like a, a brother to them over there. So that they accepted you as one of them. That's, that's awesome. That's the best way to do it. Like you said, don't go in with the angle to try to capitalize on everything they're doing. Go in there with the angle to learn and then become buddies. And then, hey, let's get in the business together and do this. And that's, I think that was the, the smartest move on your part. So completely unplanned. It just, yeah, that was just how it worked out. Yeah, that's outstanding. If you want to just go more in depth, uh, what uh, what is a shochu? So the the lay person that listen to this uh, back home here in the states is saying, oh, I want to because you know most of our audience here likes to drink. Will they yeah. be able? To, <laughs> will they? Will their palate get wet thinking about this? <laughs> All right, I, I like this. This is uh, certainly in my wheelhouse. All right, um, so. <laughs> Shochu is Japan's best kept secret. Um, and I say that I've got data to back it up. There is more shochu made in Japan than tequila in Mexico. Wow. Now about two thirds of tequila is exported. A lot of it comes to the States. Some of it comes over here to Japan. I can buy tequila in just about every supermarket I walk into. Less than 1%, far less than 1% of shochu and awamori is exported out of Japan. So it's this gigantic in industry that's kind of hiding in plain sight. And it's been around for more than five centuries. This is not some trendy thing. It's not some, something that's cooked up by an ad agency. This is part and parcel with Japanese culinary culture. And it's made all across the country, every single prefecture, but it's primarily ensconced in the su southwestern prefectures, starting from Okinawa, where I happen to be right now, going up through Kyushu Island, which is seven prefectures. Now, in that, those seven prefectures in Kyushu, you've got, oh, geez, it's unreal, the amount of distilling that's going on down there. Let me just talk about Kagoshima for a second, the southerly, <laughs> most southerly of the uh, prefectures in that island. Kagoshima is famous for sweet potato shochu. There are more distilleries per capita in Kagoshima prefecture than Scotland, Tennessee, and Kentucky combined. Wow. And you shake it, you shake a stick, you'll hit four or five distilleries. It's unreal. The state or the prefecture itself is smaller geographically than Connecticut, but it has so much distilling going on. And 
you know, in Japan, if you if you sum it all up, there's more shochu and awamori consumed here than sake. And this is something that just even Japanese folks, folks who have lived there and here their entire lives, have they don't believe me when I say that. And I have tax data to back it up. Shochu and awamori have outsold sake every year since 2003. Wow. So it's just this behemoth of a cultural entity. It's a it's a it's foundational to Japan's food and drink culture. And yet it just does not really sail. It hasn't really needed to find foreign markets until very recently. And it's coming. And I'll tell you where to get it soon. Um, but before I get there, let me just talk about what makes these drinks special. So shochu by definition, is a single pot distilled, which is weird, spirit made from approved ingredients and their koji, K-O-J-I, koji. Koji is super, super important. It's a microbe. It's a mold that is used to make everything in Japan from miso, like miso soup, to soy sauce, to sake, to, of course, shochu, awamori, and then other koji fermented food and drinks, such as uh, koji whiskey and gin, and also something, you know, now they're experimenting with rum. And it's just, it's this, it's this strain of wild mold, um, wild molds, molds that are, they're everywhere. They live on plants. It's just, it's kind of like yeast. They're everywhere. And they've been, a few strains have been domesticated and used in production. And they basically take the place of malting, if you know about beer or you know about whiskey. And so shochu, I like to say, is probably the most diverse spirit in the world. It can be made, as I have said already, from sweet potatoes and rice and barley and kukuto sugar and, um, what was the other one I said? I said buckwheat and isoba. But there's, what well, that's five. So that means that there are 48 other approved ingredients. There's 53 total. And they all taste like what they're made from because of the single pot distillation. When I say single pot, I'm not talking about in an Irish whiskey sense. I'm talking about you take the fermentation and you run it through a pot still only once, which most to most, most people that's Greek. But if you understand what, how distillation works, if you paid attention in high school chemistry, you know that distilling a solution leads to a purer form of that solution. Now, if you're trying to make a vodka, that means you're, you're using a column still to make something with crazy high alcohol, probably 96% ABV, and with very little character left over from the ingredients that were used to make it. With a pot still, you're going for the exact opposite you're going for a lower alcohol, higher character. So most shochu is distilled to between 37 and 44% alcohol, which is not particularly high. Mo all whiskey, not all, most whiskey, all whiskey made in the States is at least 40. Um, shochu can be as low as, it can be as low as you want to go. Often it, it comes off the still at 37, 38, 39 for a sweet potato, especially, which is not going to, knock anybody's socks off necessarily, but the amount of character, the amount of aroma, the esters from the fermentation are so intact in that spirit that it punches way above its weight. And this is the story of shochu and awamori made across the country. These are spirits that are just like, what the heck is that? Does, what is this made from? Oh well, yeah, well, you know what? That's made from water chestnuts. <laughs> or no, that's made from kelp or yeah, well, good, congratulations. You found a shochu made from milk. And it has, it's just as, as wild and as wide as you can probably imagine. A shochu that is made from carrots is going to taste so different from a shochu that is made from silver vine. And silver vine is basically catnip on steroids. These, it's just the most fascinating, it's the deepest most convoluted and windingest rabbit hole you've ever encountered in your life. And I am in the middle of my face first plunge through this thing. It's, it's been the ride of a lifetime.
I bet and uh, tasting all the all 53 flavors, I bet I'm sure you've you've hit a bunch of them. You've those five that you mentioned probably your favorites. Uh, and I think the, the way you described it sounds like something like you sip on while you're eating it, something like you said earlier, you compare with it and also enjoying the company with instead of just pounding shots like you would with vodka or or a mixed drink with vodka. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's a sipping drink. It is a slow paced drink. It can be consumed a number of different ways. You, could, you can drink it neat, but most people here don't. Um, most people drink it over ice with some, a little bit of water for dilution, sometimes with hot water, hmm. uh, especially when the temperature drops, when the mercury um, you know, basically uh, escapes us. And it, it really is going to take over the cocktail world in the States very soon. We're seeing tons of, in fact, I think right now, it may still be cocktail week in New York where they're just using shochu at cocktail bars all over the place. And it's really new to the cocktail, co cocktail world in the States. And it's, I believe is gonna take the entire industry by storm. There's just too many tools available to bartenders. They can win competitions with this stuff. Nobody's tasted, nobody's tasted a tomato shochu before. Nobody's tasted a shochu made from green tea. You know, these are elements, these are shades and, and avenues that they can take in their mixology that are just going to blow people away, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, living in Korea, soju was the big thing there. And coming to the States and seeing soju in stores here, it's not the same as it is over there, but people still just pound it like it's a just a regular party shot. And I don't see that happening with this. I think this is going to be one of those we see guys or gals sitting around a fire, sipping on it while telling stories and stuff. So I think that'd be a, a that. good drink. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, you made this, the soju connection. I think that's important, especially for the United States because the U S is a confusing marketplace for these drinks. The reason why is California. Cal it's California's fault. Let me, let me um, cast some aspersions if you don't mind. So yeah. back in the nineties in California, and it would let me get, let, sorry, let me give you my thesis first. My thesis is American consumers tend to conflate. They, they confuse Korean soju and Japanese shochu. And we, we've both, we both lived in Korea. We know that we, we can, we know the difference. So um, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'll start out by saying I'm not intending any disrespect to Korea, Korean culture or Korean products. I, I live there, I get it. I go back every year. Um, back in the nineties, the Korean diaspora lobbied the legislature in California state to be allowed to serve soju, which is a spirit on a soft license in, in California. What that means is if you happen to have a restaurant and you don't have a full bar license, you don't, you're not serving tequila and you're not serving gin, but you're serving beer and wine. On a soft license, you could also serve soju in California state, so long as it clearly said S-O-J-U on the label, and it was bottled at 24% ABV or lower. That was a boon to Korean barbecue restaurants that just wanted to, I mean, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're oh, yeah. eating around a table with your, with your friends, your family, the little green bottles come mm -hmm. out, <laughs> and you're pouring those little glasses for each other, and it's, it's, communal it's social it's right and the sweetness of the soju goes so well with the spiciness of korean food and i can only imagine that it felt very empty to be eating korean food in california and not have soju at the table but legally you couldn't do that it's different from korea it's different from japan you can't just serve a spirit in a regular restaurant you know right. so they fixed it they got it they lobbied the legislature and they made that exception that amendment and that was in the 90s. And the freaking some of the big players in the show two markets by they saw an opportunity. And some of the makers over here were like, oh, that's a, this is an opportunity, isn't it? Here's a big chance. What if we just mislabel our products yeah. for the California market as soju? Uh -huh. And we'll lower it. Standard here is 25, 25% ABV for shochu. What if we just dilute one more percent to 24? mislabel it for the Californian market. And then we can sell into all of these izakaya and sushi bars and, and places like that, that, you know, where shochu really belongs. And so they did that. 
And we were going on, geez, we're closely getting on three decades of this willful mislabeling. And these labels don't stay just in California. These are distributed all across the United States. So there is shochu and awamori that is mislabeled as soju just to get around this California exception. Wow. And it has created so much miseducation in the United States. It, I spend half of my time when I'm in the States on sales calls and educational um, escapades explaining to people how what I'm trying to sell them is not soju. <laughs> because people, quite frankly, have um, have memory. They well, maybe they don't have memories. They they have a memory of a hangover that they do not want to repeat. Right from an escapade with soju, <laughs> and it's just a different. It's a totally different anim animal. Animal um, soju is a basically it's a vodka that is ultra diluted and then it has sweeteners added to it it has you know it used to be stevia or aspartame um sorbitol was another additive that they used to use they they sweeten it and now you have all these fruity versions which are super popular around the world i mean i've seen like musk like grape soju and melon soju and a bunch of other ones they're everywhere the little green bottles are just they're all over the place now phenomenal sales network going on and it's really just a totally different experience, a total di totally different intent. And uh, unfortunately, it's an it's a hundred percent own goal on the part of the shochu industry, just willfully mislabeling. It's I use the F word. Some it's fraudulent. I mean, now the only reason why it's not fraud yet is because. Soju and shochu are not recognized spirits categories by the TTB, which is the government entity that regulates labeling of spirits and tobacco. Uh, well, well, all alcohol and tobacco. But I, I, I hope at some point when they differentiate between the two, then a lot of these shochu makers will have to, to change their ways because it's, it's not cool. Yeah, I hope so. And you said earlier, uh... The shochu will come to the States and uh, you'll tell us where you said New York are doing the cocktail week now, where you envision your product coming uh, in the next year or so or years or so. Well, that's, thank you. That's, uh, that's, thank you for putting the ball on the tee for me there. Um, my company that is in the States is called Honkaku Spirits, as you said, at the top of the show. And our goal is to bring in a lot of these really small batch spirits that they're basic i'm not gonna lie these are my friends products I, i've been friends with these families for a while and i want to see them succeed um we have a portfolio currently of nine shochu and one whiskey and if you go to our website honkakuspirits.com then you can use the find a retailer and and gps will tell you exactly which retail shops and which bars and restaurants near you have it now we are in in Tennessee. And, um, but we're only in Tennessee right now with our whiskey, okay. uh, which I, I don't think people in Tennessee will mind at all. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you, if you don't mind a little bit of a, a plug for the whiskey, I can tell a kind of cool story. Um, the whiskey is inspired by probably, and you know, I don't mean to no disrespect to the amazing Japanese baseball players that are like Ootani and Matsui before him and Ichiro. But the most consequential Japanese person to have ever lived in the United States was named Dr. Jokichi Takamine. And he lived in the States from the 1890s until his death uh, before World War II. And the whiskey that we bring in called Takamine is inspired by his story. And I'll a quick, quick run through of what that is. The guy's a, pretty much a genius. He gets sent to the World Cotton Expo in, in Louisiana in the 1880s. Boy meets girl, boy marries girl. They end up in Illinois because boy is a genius and he's from a sake making family and he patents, he gets the first biologic patent ever awarded in US history. For the use of koji, I said that before, it's the mold. It's the Japanese mold used to make bourbon. I don't know how you patent that. You shouldn't be able to. I think the patent office thought that he had come up with this mold on his own or something. 
but he had the patent for it and he sold it to the Illinois Whiskey Trust. This trust uh -huh. was the biggest whiskey maker to ever make. It was, it was a monopoly to end all monopolies. They were making more than 75% of whiskey available in the United States. They had so many distilleries under their umbrella. It was a monopoly. And he convinced them that he could make whiskey faster, cheaper, and taste better. And they were listening. They set him up with a lab in, in the Manhattan distillery in Peoria, Illinois. And he was successful. He was making whiskey with koji. This was a maltless whiskey. No malt. No malted barley, which is a whole industry by itself. Malting barley. There are maltsters. There's, that's a business. That's a, that's a vocation. And he was going to skip that entire industry to bring whiskey to the masses using koji. They got written up in the paper. And a couple of weeks later, it wasn't anything like crazy, but you know, whiskey's going to be cheaper. It's coming, you know, whatever. And the trust stood to make a ton of a boatload of money off of this. I mean, they were going to, there were estimates that it was going to shave 15% off the cost of producing their products. And if it was successful, you can imagine they were going to roll it out to every distillery in their network. And this is, you know, more than three quarters of show, uh, sorry, whiskey made in the States at the time. Two weeks after the newspaper article, guess what happens? Shut the down. lab burns down under ah. mysterious circumstances. And actually, the, the story is way, way more insidious than that. The maltsters apparently tried to kill him. He was wow. about to put him out of business, essentially, or at least they were about to lose a substantial part of their business, anything that was not beer related. And it set him back by a few years. Anyways, fast forward, he, four years later, 1894, they're making and barreling Koji whiskey. This is crazy, 1894. This is the year that Masataka Taketsuru, the godfather of Japanese whiskey was born. The first person to ever make whiskey, the first Japanese person to ever make whiskey was doing it in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> they're putting the whiskey away. A few months later though, then legislation, legislation bites them in the backside on the Sherman Antitrust Act. This is Teddy Roosevelt, Roosevelt's heyday when he was super antitrust, which is a good thing because it's busting up monopolies. It's good, good for the consumer. Bad for Takamine. The distillery goes into receivership. They sell everything off and it's a, you know, it's a fire sale. And his, he never recovered his patent. Man. But he was the first Japanese person to, to make whiskey in the history of never ever. And it was a failed part of his, his, you know, his story, but he was hugely important to, to the world and to, to America after that. He moved to Harlem and had a home lab and he isolated in his home lab, he was a chemist, he isolated medical adrenaline, which is the first time in human history that a, that a biologic hormone, a human hormone has been isolated for use in medicine. Oh. And if you've ever had somebody in your, in your world use an EpiPen, you know, you have Dr. Takamine to thank for that. I mean, he has saved so many millions of lives since then with that, um, with that discovery. And as you can imagine, after licensing that to Park Davis, which is a huge pharmaceutical company, he became fantabulously wealthy and spent the rest of his life basically working towards Japanese-American relations. He, and this is coming up, he paid for and organized the donation of the cherry trees to Washington, D.C. Uh. That's all him. And he did it quietly. He didn't want any credit for it. The guy was just absolutely amazing. And he's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. He is not known in Japan, really. I mean, they, they teach school kids about his cherry tree donation, but they don't teach them about a lot of his other amazing accomplishments. And there are many. And one that doesn't ever end up in his timeline is the, the whiskey experiment. So we were incredibly inspired by this gentleman and we wanted to kind of close the circle on it. <laughs> so we went to his family trust in, to use the word trust again, which it has a very different meaning in this case, not a monopoly, a family <laughs> trust in Japan. And we said, hey, can we, we really, really respect your great granddad. Can we, can we use his name? And they had never before granted 
commercial use of his name on a product that he didn't have something to personally do with, but they allowed us to use it. And so Takam, Takamine Koji's whiskey, an eight year maltless whiskey is available in Tennessee Absolutely. and, and many other U S states. And I'm incredibly biased, but if you have a chance to try it, you will not be disappointed. It won double gold and best in category at the John Barley, Barley corn awards uh, late last year. You know, it's just, it's, a, it's the easiest thing to talk about and sell I've ever experienced in my life because you just got to get it in a glass in front of somebody's nose and they're like, oh, what is this? And then, uh, and then good things happen after that. <laughs> That's usually when good things really do happen. When things smell nice and you start sipping on it and oh, and then it's the morning somehow. <laughs> but it's a great day, great time right. to, to celebrate with friends and do that. So I'll definitely, uh, since I'm sitting in Tennessee, I will go and find this at my local, uh, my local favorite store and see if it's in there. And if they don't have it, I'll ask them why not. Thank you very much. Much yeah. appreciated. And of course, I'll ask on, on the military base. I'm sure I'll have it there too, but it'll be, it'll be hidden behind something, so I'll have to find it. Go dig, yeah. <laughs> Since they stock shelves a little differently there. But <laughs> Well, Chris, uh, any advice you want to give someone that's thinking about becoming a brewer, a distiller, or like you did going overseas and doing it, any advice you'd want to give them? I, I think the, the best advice, it's, it's, it's hard work. Um, so I would say the first thing that you should do is go spend a couple of days working in a brewery or a distillery to see if it's really, you know, up your alley. Um, and if you don't mind the backbreaking work, <laughs> if you don't mind the process of it, uh, then it, it, it is some, it's super infectious and there's, it's a, it's a craft and it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's just like, I think it's, it's like, it's like cooking. It's like working with wood. It's working with your hands. And there's something truly beautiful about that. And it's a, it's a trade that for me, I, you know, I, while I don't make drinks, I help. I don't actually, it's not my job anymore, but it is something that I have an immense amount of respect for. If that's, a, if that's your day in and day out, you know, my hat's off to you because it's a lot of work and you, you do have to, you have to really love it. And, and so um, if you're that type of person, dip your toes in, give it a shot. Um, and just, just um, there's a reverence, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a care that goes into it that I think is really, really beautiful. And if you take, if you're able to replicate that type of attention to any other aspect of your life, I think really positive things are going to work out for you. It's just, it's a, it's an attention to the smells and the, the, the sounds and the rhythm of these living and breathing um, products that the same attention paid elsewhere is, is hugely beneficial in my opinion. Outstanding. This whole conversation, I can tell your passion for the whole industry. It's, it's amazing. And I'm sure that's infectious to the rest of your team and the rest of your employees your passion towards this and it really helps out how does someone get in contact with you to just have a chat with you and, and find out some of the things you learned or even to get you to come on the, their show in the future oh cheers um i'm very easy to track down online so i'm pretty active on instagram and twitter uh chris pellegrini on twitter p-e-l-l-e-g-r-i-n-i -E -E and then full christopher pellegrini on instagram uh, Facebook as well. Actually, I, I do have a re relatively active page on there. I think my name is switched. So I think it's Pellegrini Christopher. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> a little bit went Japanese on that one. Um, and uh, very, very, you know, I just, I love to have conversations. I've got people who send me photos of, of menu, bar menus. And they're like, um, you're probably not going to check this in the next 15 minutes, but if you can, would you mind telling me which of these shows you are worth my time? And, you know, if I'm up, and I see it, I'm going to be like, oh, okay. Yeah, the third one down, Try, definitely get that one. You know, or, or I'm going to ask you like, what do you normally drink? Because that's an important question here. In yeah. order, if you've never had shoju before, I think we need to figure out where you're coming from. Um, I am, I love those conversations. They're tons of fun. And then you get, you know, occasionally you, you get people who are just like, well, this was just wild. I did not expect that. I am definitely coming back here. And I've got, I've, I've made friends from those conversations. I've got, I've got folks from like 2008 
who I've met up with in, in Vancouver and in Atlanta and in Paris and just who are just like, I had no idea how fun this could be. <laughs> I'm like, hey, man, if I can just show you the light, just a little bit, I'll crack the door open. You got to you gotta kick it open your, yourself because this is there's not a lot of information out there about these products. But if right. you can just kind of wedge your way through there, I promise you, man, you're, you're never going to look back. This is just, it's so much fun. <laughs> As I said, that your passion is infectious. And this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot and I've wrote a lot of notes down here. And I'm definitely going to be going out and trying to find the, the whiskey tomorrow, hopefully, lo- hopefully close to me. And I'll have to go all the way down to Nashville to find it. But thanks Cheers, again. Rich. I really appreciate it, man. Thank <laughs> thanks you. again for taking your time to be on with us tonight. Cheers.